Okay, join me now in part two, and where we look at Moses, and uh, we're going to look at the beginning of his life with the reed basket, and uh, see if we find any similarities with somebody that we find uh, through history in the same area, and uh, that he would have been well aware of, and look at the parting of the Red Sea, the uh, burning bush, uh, which was a visitation by an angel, and... Uh, so is Sinai, as it says in, in the Bible itself, as we look through this. But, uh, you know, the parting of the Red Sea um, has now been looked at as being an impossibility. Uh, where we at in the picture right here, uh, behind you are going to be 160 to 200 foot tall cliffs all up and down the coast. There's not a place that's all smoothed out where there's a ramp to walk down or back up and no one ever figures that or even thinks of that. They're just so wondrous on the fact that there's walls of water that they um, don't really fathom the fact that you couldn't have got down there and back up with anybody, all the elderly. I mean, it takes it would take a professional rappelling mountain climber to rappel down this thing, you know, and, and unless God did something like hovered each one down and across and now, if he's going to do that, just throw him on his spaceship and cruise. I mean, but none of that's mentioned. It's just that, well, there's this place called the Reed Sea. And it's actually in the middle of their route, supposedly on the way coming out. And if you look at that route, now the original story that you find in the Septuagint and the older ones seems to hearken more to the idea that a, a great wind came and blew the waters apart like this. And uh, if you take the Red Sea and turn it into the Reed Sea, there was a path through the Reed Sea, but it was a marsh, and a great wind would blow the waters back and allow people to have a decent egress through there, and they were able to go through without getting attacked by the Leviathan and the crocodiles, and everything's fine, so that's different. One more interesting fact before we get started is that it has been said, now I didn't calculate this out, but if you take the 600,000 plus people that they have, and... Uh, and you have them leave Egypt, and you have them lead four side by side, you know, man, woman, man, woman, whatever you want to do, um, four side by side, five foot apart, so they're all walking like in a marching situation, that if they were to go straight to Sinai, that by the time that they got to Sinai, there would still be a about one-sixth, one-eighth of the people still standing in Egypt waiting to get in line that it's actually unfeasible that 605,000 people left, by the way, would be more on the kin of 6,500. And it's, again, never really mentioned anywhere. And even in Egypt and things, it doesn't seem like it's, it's mentioned anywhere. So it wasn't uh, that big of a deal. It was probably something a little different. Names like Moses come up in the word Tut Moses and Ah Moses and a man named Ra Moses, which is who it probably could have been wrote after, but then they, he steals a few things from other people's history. And so let's take a look at this. We're going to start off at the basket where he's a half breed floated down the river to save his life. A little interjection here. Here's the Moses in a basket ritual that uh, our mythology that people know about where uh, of course here's the white version of it where you see a lot of white versions of it but there actually is more ethnic versions of what you find here like an Egyptian version or the black by the white person version or the Egyptian version of a Hebrew I'm guessing or you know uh, well there, there's a more white version there too uh, it just depends but of course the you know, if you try to make it come up north towards Greece, it's going to be Phoenicians and white people and everything. So there's all that thought that he had to do with that. But of course, the rivers on the other side flow that way. And that's where he actually lived. The Ur of the Chaldees was on the other side. They said they were going north. They were going towards the North Star. There would be north. So that's the same direction. It's just a, a different look at it. Ironically, this story of Moses um, having come down the river in a basket uh, is found a little over 850 years, somewhere around 800, 850 years beforehand, and that it was somewhat plagiarized um, of Sargon the Great. Um, 
he had humble origins. He was abandoned by his mother and placed in a reed basket in the river. So that's your basis for the Moses story where he came floating down the river. Well, he didn't do it in Egypt. That's the reason they can't really find that in Egypt. You, d you can find this guy named Ra Moses, and that may be where it comes off of, but what it was supposed to be is that he eventually overthrows his father. And uh, Sargon overthrows his father, and then he eventually works his way through all the Sumerian cities and takes over as he gets more grown bigger and more professional he he sees the control of the trade routes and the natural resources uh, silver and the rivers there and by doing so he took over the land and he also developed that thing where you'd get outside of city walls and just keep siege on a city until they started running out of food and then they would try to do some type of um treaty with you which um with this man here didn't work out well for the sumerians and ancient sumerians are gone but the Akkadians kept some of them alive and tried to usurp their intelligence and what they had. And it's where we get a lot of the Akkadian tablets that are the exact same stories of Sumerian stuff, just written with slightly different names. Most of them, word for word, are the same names and the same stories. Uh, you can find the Epic of Gilgamesh there, but they say that that was from the Sumerians, and the Sumerians said it was from an ancient time before time, long, long ago. Not even long ago, but long, long ago. When the Sumerians do a double on something, they kind of mean a lot of it. So, um, yeah, so the basket story kind of comes from here. So here are some pictures of Sargon, and then, of course, there's some pictures of him floating in a basket here. When you look up Sargon, it shows you that he's the one that had this origin here. They're all over this website where you can see this depiction of it and everything. Uh, some of the old people thought that he was a Sumerian, that Akkadians were Sumerian. Now, we got smarter in the 1950s when we finally started deciphering this stuff. So, most of this intelligence is really kept from the public. I mean, it was deciphered in the 1950s. Uh, a few people wrote books in the 1960s, including uh, um, a couple of well-known authors. In the 70s, Sitchin wrote his book trying to relate it, and oh, everything was all looked at as being like, oh, that's just kind of hokey majokey, kind of like the story of um, all the uh, gods of Greece and Rome and how that's just got to be some hokey majokey. But, of course, people are still going with this rib grew into a woman that talked to a talking snake and made it eat something off a magic tree and we're all screwed because of it. And that's cool, but this this Greek thing just can't go. But anyhow, in his story there, um, uh, people know now that he's part of the Akkadian Empire. Around 2335 BC is whenever this actually kicked off. And you can see all these depictions of this Sargon of Akkad and uh, how he was sent down the river on a basket 800 plus years before Moses. Oh, I'm sorry. Ding. Yeah. Oh, and before, ding. Yeah, or the other one. So Sargon's story is that he was uh, found by a, a gardener of the priestess Inanna and found floating in a basket in a river and they raised him as their own child and the baby later became the Akkadian emperor Sargon by overthrowing him and stuff. One of the very first, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, um, Alexander the Great's, this was Sargon the Great that took over all of Mesopotamia, which at that time was a large portion of the world, very large portion of the world. In fact, his taking over of that kind of spread people out farther because they ran away from it in all directions when he came at them, and that caused people to go far away because they didn't want to come back to it. Another interesting fact, you know, all these Sumerian pictures always have this guy and he's got his hand out like this, doing this little talking or next to a tree. There's quite a few depictions of him here where he's just resting his hand on a sword. And he's got a ruler staff, so he's kind of changed the ideographic you know, look of it and everything here by the time he takes over. But of course, that's way, way late. When we talk about Sumerians, they're the people that were before this man dating back, you know, thousands of years, um, at least 7,000 years uh, B.C., somewhere around in that range it looks like that they're maxing out at. And, of course, that's the cuneiform there. Now we find that um, Enki and the people before then, even tells you in the tablets, used to be up in the mountains above in Iraq, 
and they went there. Um, and now we're finding errata in the civilization that was there. And indeed, errata is mentioned in the Sumerian tablets as people that they put in place that were great craftsmen. And Anna even goes to them for craftings and things. Some things go wrong with that, too. And later, that probably ends up becoming this empire that twists on them or people that were rebelled from that that ran off. If you look here, though, Sargon is believed to be among the first military leaders to ever use soldiers armed with bows and arrows. And they had the double bent back bow, not just like a regular lawn bow, but it had that curled back kind of look to it. And uh, they could really, you know, thump a bow. And uh, these were the first real big archers, too. And through their little conquest and then people coming through, this is where archery really took off because he could bring a group of archers in and come near the walls and shoot over the walls and take out people due to the arrows and stuff. So see Sargon here in a lot of depictions. It almost looks like, I don't know, Leonard Nimoy that's um, quite a bit bronzed, been out in the sun a little too long. So he has them one of that look to him and uh, full bearded and everything. But uh, interesting fact, he used to uh, hang out with the warriors, uh, that he was a warrior king. And so he uh, came out and hang out with the warriors, which was uncommon for anybody in that time at all. I mean, your generals are your generals and stuff. But he was a warrior king that hung around and ate with the uh, troops and things. And that helped rile him up quite a bit and help go. You know, not only was he a king, but he was also their general. And um, it also, there's a belief that the Tower of Babylon story comes from something whenever he came down and sieged the city. And when they talk about in the Tower of Babel how they shot arrows up in there and it hit gods and they knew they were getting close to building it high enough, that it was these people who shot arrows up in the sky and it came down and it was drawing blood. And these other people, the Sumerians, on the way out the door, knew that uh, that these people were finding their god and it's almost a twist on the story because it was written by the victor and so they turned the other people's story into their story twisted with the victor standpoint but onward back to the rest of this um, exodus oh before we go i mean doesn't that just look like moses too and if you just grayed out his beard a little more of course moses got gray after seeing god and stuff and of course when he became much older they'd wondered for 40 years 40 years from now this guy's gonna be real gray but uh very much the symbol of moses very much so with the staff and the the look of him and everything even though you know he was much more of a warrior king the difference i find in the description though between this guy here and moses is that moses had horns We'll get to that. But yeah, Moses had horns. Scared the hell out of people too, but we'll get to that. Okay, so here he is, Moses with horns. And uh, all you have to do is type in Moses with, and you're going to find, I found on Google Images, that horns came up first, believe it or not, after tablets uh, and after sheep and so on, and Israel, actually, and uh, wanderers and stuff like that was below it. The first one was horns. And you can find it in all these early depictions. I'll pop up some of these and just show you these and stuff. Or these early, early Christian depictions where he's got horns right there. And uh, so, and, and, and I don't want to have to show you too many of these, but some of these are extremely famous pictographs here of them. And uh, I've got some pictures I could show you, I guess, in between the slides here of them. But, uh, you know, very, very famous inside of a church here uh, and, and that's a, a wood carving that's uh, been around for well over a thousand years and it's definitely Moses for the name that's on it so yeah that's what he looked like when he came down from the mountain if you want to see it in in the scripture look where he came down from the mountain and the exact words of course you got to look at the older Bibles the new ones they changed it now they want to say it was rays of light coming out of his eyes or out the out the tops of his head but that's not what anybody else saw when they read the scripture up until they changed it of course you know i talk about famous ones but this is actually michelangelo's version of it here 
And supposedly this version and the next one I'll show you is uh, the reason that they picked Charlton Heston, that he really had that look and they wanted to go for the look that people were familiar with. They did not give him horns though, but you can see the horns that are right here. Interesting fact, this was made for Julius II and um, one of the priests asked him why that he had done that and he asked him if he had a Bible. They reached and grabbed one real quick and, and went to hand it to him. He, he, reached and pulled it out of their hand, opened it up, it didn't take him too long, and he started reading, and he read the exact scripture that has it to where whenever he came down off the mountains, they had the horns, and the people were afraid of him back and backed away. And he said after he saw God, he had horns. And from then on, that he had horns. And he used to cover him up with a veil, and it says it in the scripture. And that that's what it is. People try to say nowadays it was a sunburn or something. I don't think people are backing away from somebody with a sunburn. And wouldn't you back away if the guy said he went up and he saw God and when he came down he looked like that? Well, straight up. No, this is, this is in the Bible. This is it. And uh, this is the other famous version that they went off of for the, uh, you know, Charlton Heston looks just like him. If you look at this, I mean, that, you know, if you take the horns off of him up here, of course, you know, then... Uh, and of course, he he really looks like Charlton Heston. I mean, he does. So they uh, this is this is true though. He you know uh, Moses had horns, people. And uh, one of the uh, hairdressers actually was asked about this and said that the reason that they uh, they teased up his hair so big is so that you couldn't see his horns in a laugh. That's so serious. You you can look this up. Uh, but uh, another interesting fact, especially about this moment in the show, is whenever they show you the Ten Commandments, the tablet on the left there, those top four letters are Anki. That is, that would be Inki. Um, so I don't know what the rest of it uh, all tabulates out to, and it seems to not have any of the uh, vowelization dots and dashes put onto it, that it seems to have just the letters so you might be able to make something out of that i haven't tried to decipher it but that's surely not all the ten commandments it must be a very condensed version but there's moses and admittedly he does look a lot like sargon of akkad and in the pictures that you see of him and so you get that same revelation and everything and people say well is the was that him was that him that rebelled that was ra moses Entirely possible, but that's not the story from the Bible at all. Okay, one clue to where um, they came from and how they were actually redeemed out of Egypt. Um, and the Exodus won't be found in Exodus, but actually in uh, the English Standard Version in Isaiah 43. And you get to Isaiah 43, and uh, it's called Israel's Only Savior. Because nobody else is going to have these people, apparently. That's what they're insinuating. It says, up here, but now, say the Lord, down. But now, says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob? Who formed you, O Israel? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. So that's all you have to do. Just call him by name, and then he's. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. You, through the rivers, they went over. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Now, what this is actually referring to, uh, people will say it's the thing about Abraham and stuff, and yeah, it does have something to do with it. Uh, that cult over there had this thing about fire, and uh, they would make two rows of coals and hot fire and sticks. And then once they all turned to coals, they would knock them all into the middle. And then people had to walk across this, and whoever faltered would be the one that would be sacrificed and eaten. And uh, kids would be forced to start doing this, too, at an early age. And uh, I believe it was seven, and then once you were 13, you could start doing a marriage thing. But then your firstborn would be subject to these things. And, of course, one of you might be the firstborn of somebody else. And three times a year, your firstborn had to go through this ritual also. So, wow, man, all these people are, you learn how to be a firework real quick or you're not around, no. But, anyhow. Oh, I'm sorry. Ding. Yeah. Oh, and before, ding. Yeah, for the other one. 
a few interesting facts about this uh, burning bush scenario a scenario that happens with Moses is that uh, well the first one I found was whenever I tried to Google image burning bush I get more pictures of this plant that makes you think maybe this was the burning bush that he saw and he was like whoa you know they get like this they're greenish but then they turn you know the leaves start turning over time like this and they end up getting this bright blood red magenta burning fire bush they call them but the other thing that I was gonna say and tell you about was that uh, in this burning bush thing it's it's an odd uh, thing for Moses to say but he says that his lips are uncircumcised his lips are uncircumcised and um, scholars and everything said that they meant that he doesn't know how to speak the language and uh, say well that's foolish because he grew up in Egypt if you remember the basket story so okay well it's not it then oh he uh, he's real shy or he has a speech impediment a speech impediment I'll, I don't know probably from him reading or something or whatever went on before him but uh, he has a speech impediment well they make Aaron speak for him it's uh, right there in the Bible that he has Aaron speak for him he tries to get out of it twice by telling him that he has uncircumcised lips and God says no it's all gonna be okay but then God's plan is instead of God showing up it's gonna actually be Moses and Moses who they are probably aware of somewhat is gonna say that he's now God and somehow that crap's gonna work well of course it doesn't and so he has to send frogs and uh, flies and pestilence and things that sounds like a great God here doesn't it and here flashing back to uh, what I have in part one but going over something I didn't have and, and again if you haven't seen part one uh, please look it up and maybe you can see it first because they kind of go together but then again it's all the same story and it you know how I do and I go back and forth a little so well, let's just continue um, this is when he tells him uh, who what's his name is and everything and he says if they ask me what's his name then what should I tell him and God says to Moses I am who I am or at the bottom it says it could be I am what I am. Well, the words used there are Ayer, Hasha, Aya. Okay, so Aya means I am, and Asher means who or what. No, no, it doesn't. We find out from, is it Rachel's kid, um, or Rebecca, or Leah, one of those group right there that's just popping out kids like crazy with Jacob here after they're all doing the Mandrake stuff, um, end up um, naming one of their kids Asher, and they say that that is happy, if I'm not mistaken, and so uh, the first name he God tells these people is, my name is I am happy I am, go tell them my name is happy I am, and you can tell Moses didn't like it, must have been an expression on his face or something. But it, he says, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Oh, okay, so hold on. Well, first of all, we found out that it was an angel of the Lord. Instead of even God that's talking to him now. But he's telling them that he is the God of their fathers. So they were just going under an angel. Makes you wonder if this is one of those fallen ones and which one of those fallen this could be. But... He's supposed to rule the world. Yeah, oh man. Um, anyhow, it says, I am has sent me to you. Well, um, so even, this is not even God. He tells you right there. He says that uh, I am sent me to you. I am sent this Yahweh character to you. You know, or whatever. So this isn't going to work good enough anyhow. And then he tells them the name Yahweh. And they've blotched it out of these Bibles. But it's in the old Hebrew one. Of course, God's going on this big tirade of, of how he's going to go and assemble the uh, elders of Israel and tell them the Lord of the God of the fathers and everything told them I watched over you and and uh, and I've seen what's been done to you in Egypt. I promised to bring you up out of your misery in the land of Canaanites and all this stuff. Well, um, hold on a minute. Yeah, you, you, you finally realized it here from generation to generation here, bud. But uh, it's been like 400 years. Somebody says 400 years. So... What you do, take a nap or something? You get a little seabies? 
he'd been kind of busy. He went, he went fishing. You know, he went on a fishing trip. What what happened here was, oh, I remembered my people. I heard misery, and then I remembered my people. You know, it, it, ding. You know, it, it, just all, all of that's just just kind of terrible. I I I am happy. I am ding. I mean, I don't know where we're at now. I think we're way up in the twenties on the red side here. Um, but, and, and that just doesn't sound good. You know, if it was even 50, 50, you'd have to question yourself here, but it just really doesn't look, I mean, it, the more you look at it, the, you know, from, from this point of view, of course, I mean, I'm not trying to say that it's holy to sacrifice your kids and shit. So, um, that's going to be a ding and, a, and I hope it is for you and everybody that's listening. But, um, he says that what he's going to do is he's going to screw them up so bad that make the Egyptians kind of favorably disposed towards the people whenever they leave. And he goes, every woman is to ask their neighbor and anyone leaving their house articles of silver and gold and clothing which you put on your sons and daughters. In fact, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Oh, that's just good. Oh, really? He's the god of R. We're going to plunder them, huh? We're going to. Well, wow, that's just disgusting. You're gonna, you're gonna like steal a bunch of shit for you leave. That's not good. And I guess you stole the, their magic stuff and some of the other stuff that you had to put in the ark too after that, huh? So that's not good. You know, Moses has got this speech impediment, and he says, "What, what, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? What do I do?" And he goes, "Well, here, let me show you a snake trick." So what he's going to do is, so now he attaches himself to snakes somehow. He knows snake tricks. He can turn a stick to snakes. Well, the Egyptians know this trick, but he's tr apparently trot the trick to Moses, and it comes off pretty good. And the cool thing is, is that he got a he got a king snake. And uh, what's the deal about king snakes? Well, they they're not venomous and stuff, so you can hang them up in your collar. But then they eat other snakes too. So when these other guys flick out their little bitty snakes and he flipped out his king snake that they'll get into a fight, and that king snake, if it's hungry enough, will actually eat other snakes pretty damn rapidly. It'll happen right in front of you. Just kind of like what they always show. Similar, you know. Yeah, so, Oh, I kind of failed to mention through all of this that uh, Moses, when, of course, was raised up in Israel after he floated down in a basket imitating Sargon. And uh, he ended up killing an Israelite. So basically what we have here is a murderer on the run. You know, by the law. I don't care. I and mean, he didn't want to see his friend get whipped. Well, that was one of their slaves and everything. They're trying to get that guy to work harder. It's accepted back then. It's not accepted now. That's just fine. But due to the law and the way things went, he was a murderer. And uh, he buried the dude in the sand someplace and then had some hokey story about two guys got in a fight and they mentioned it. And so he got scared and ran. Yeah, like, they mentioned it, like, what are you going to do? Bury me in the sand like the Egyptians? And all of a sudden he's like, oh, no, they're going to find out, so I'm going to run. So he runs and becomes a, a, just a shepherder, I guess, for this uh, guy in Median. And uh, that's what he goes back and forth to and everything. And then uh, now we've gotten to the point where he's, you know, going to try to have Aaron talk for him. So if you don't believe it, he tries twice to get out of it. He says, uh, you know, Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, but I have never been eloquent never in the past nor since have you spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And he goes, hey, who gave everybody mouths? You're, you're going to be fine. The Lord said you're great. And he goes, um, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send somebody else. So what we have now is a, uh, so the, God's Chosen is going to be a runaway murderer with a lisp. And it can't talk for himself. And so uh, the Lord, Lord's anger burned against Moses. Boy, he gets mad about that. And he says, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you and he'll be glad to see you. You'll speak to him and you'll put words in his mouth. I'll help both of you speak and teach you what to do. He'll speak to people for you and everything. I'll show you that trick, the snake trick. Make sure you do it real good. It will be as if he were in your mouth. So whenever he talks to you, that, and as if you were God to him. So Moses is supposed to play God. Now, this is disgusting. 
He says, but take this staff in your hand so you can form the signs with it, so you can do that stick to snake trick. Okay, well, you know, if he shows up with a stick to snake trick, I don't, I don't care who, whoever thinks in their mind, and it's been silly to think through it, that Pharaoh didn't just have him hung up on the wall right then and say, well, you're God, get yourself down. Uh, once you get yourself down, I'll worship you. If you don't get yourself down, um, we're going to dig your eyes out and kill you. And that's the end of it. I'm sure they thought they were going to die walking into the situation. It's kind of silly, but Moses is supposed to act like he's God. God can't even show up. God can't even do his thunder thing, his little trick. Later he's going to make some uh, hail and everything, you know, but he should have done something on call. No, he's like, go do a stick to snake trick. Something that their their little magicians already know. This is sad. A ding. Okay, so now he goes back to Midian and he tells the um, guy that he's been working for that he wants to um, go back to, he went to Jethro and, and his father-in-law and said to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt and see if there's any left alive. Jethro said, go and, and, and do wish as you will. Now the Lord said to Moses and me, go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. Yeah, there's a lot of people that wanted to kill him because he had murdered a guard or somebody of the Egyptian staff. And it's not something that's going to be forgotten right now either. If they realize who he is, it's over. But so Moses took his wife and sons and put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. That's not the staff of God. That's the staff of Moses. It's a stick he already had, and God showed him how to turn it into a stick. But it's not even that. It's a trick where they flick it out of their collar. So now all of a sudden, Moses is God, huh? Because that's Moses' staff. That's not too cool. Oh, here's another thing that's kind of funny. Um, believe it or not, Jews say that this donkey right here and the donkey that Isaac took up and um, was going to sacrifice the kid with was one of the donkeys that was on Noah's Ark 2, and it's this ever-perpetual magical donkey that um, he on, he on, and uh, the Christmas donkey, and he uh, he's actually the donkey that Jesus Christ the Messiah rides in on. It's that same damn donkey. Couldn't have been, oh, it's just amazing. It's this holy donkey keeps showing up. There's a holy donkey. He on. I should make a whole video on a holy donkey. Maybe I'll do one at Christmas. Eeyaw, eeyaw. So now he sends him off to do the wonders for Pharaoh. And it gets real strange here. He says, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I told you, let my son go. So he's playing the part of God. He's saying, let my son go. So he may worship me. Now, oh, by the way, what is, what is Jupiter... What does Saturn do to his uh, kids, his firstborn son? What is it that this guy wants to have to So he's just going to kill all these Israeli people. That's it, that's it, you know. That's it, so I will kill your firstborn. You won't let him kill them, so I'm going to kill somebody's firstborn. Somebody's firstborn's about to go. There's the little trick. There, here, there it is again. Somebody's firstborn's got to go, and they got that stuck in there. So here we get to 24, and it gets real strange. It says right here at 24... That God's going to kill Moses. Yeah, they usually don't preach this. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Yep, God was about to kill Moses. It's the next thing after this. We were on 22, 23, now we're on 24. But Zipporah took out a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Who's Zipporah, his wife? Don't, aren't they automatically circumcised after eight days and everything? I mean, what the hell is this? So then she, she touches Moses' feet with a bloody foreskin and says, Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me. And so the Lord left him alone. Really? Like the Lord was going to kill him if his kid wasn't circumcised? Uh, what, what the hell are we supposed to claim out of that? But the Lord was going to kill Moses at a lodge. He's going to meet him at a lodge. It's kind of a showdown. He's going to sneak up on him when he's sleeping or something. And I don't know. That's just, just wickedly stupid. Oh, I'm sorry. Ding. Yeah. Oh, and before, ding. Yeah, for the other one. 
So here at 29, Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed it. They bought that crap, so maybe it'll work on, on the Pharaoh. When they, and when they were heard all this crap, they bowed down and they worshipped. And boy, this might just work. I mean, they bought the snake trick, right? No, it, it, it actually doesn't work for Moses. Okay, one clue to where um, they came from and how they were actually redeemed out of Egypt um, and the Exodus won't be found in Exodus, but actually in uh, the English Standard Version in Isaiah 43. And you get to Isaiah 43, and uh, it's called Israel's Only Savior. There's nobody else is going to have these people, apparently. That's what they're insinuating. It says, up here, but now, say the Lord, down. But now, says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob? Who formed you, O Israel? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. So that's all you have to do. Just call him by name. And then he's, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. You, through the rivers, they went over. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. Now what this is actually referring to, uh, people will say it's the thing about Abraham and stuff. And yeah, it does have something to do with it. Uh, that cult over there had this thing about fire. And uh, they would make two rows of coals and hot fire and sticks. And then once they all turned to coals, they would knock them all into the middle. And then people had to walk across this, and whoever faltered would be the one that would be sacrificed and eaten. And uh, kids would be forced to start doing this, too, at an early age. And uh, I believe it was seven, and then once you were 13, you could start doing a marriage thing. But then your firstborn would be subject to these things. And, of course, one of you might be the firstborn of somebody else. And three times a year, your firstborn had to go through this ritual also. So, wow, man, all these people are, you learn how to be a fireworker real quick or you're not around, no. But, anyhow, just to get where we uh, know where we're coming from or where these guys actually had come from here, it says, uh, For I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I gave Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Sheba in exchange for you. By the way, up here when it says, Fear not, I've redeemed you. That's the same word you use to buy a slave. So, this is starting to look a little fishy. I gave Egypt and Cush and Sheba in exchange for you, for the Hebrews. Uh, how did you give an exchange? You... You almost have traded off with some of the other gods or something. Is that what you're? It's what you're insinuating because only gods can, you know, possess people apparently and be the lords over them, right? So that's it. And uh, even down here it says, um, "I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I'm with you. I bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I gather you. I will say to the north, give up." And to the south, do not withhold. Well, to the north is the Greeks and Romans, and they're not going to play this shit. And uh, south is the Egyptians that are pretty much, you know, uh, apparently enemies of these people. And in some endemic way, even though the Egyptians can't have a really good record of it, they seem to think so. And uh, then you have, well, it could be when Egypt killed Persia off, because, you know, Persians have to do with the Hura Mazda and everything, and that ties all together with the whole Jesus thing and everything, so. Um, and that's Babylonian. They have the same little wing disc god and everything for Hura Mazda, but we'll get there later. Um, but this right here, it tells you, you know, give up on the people to the north and do not mess with the people south, so that leaves black people totally out of it. Now, they get crazy about the Bible, and lately, lately they've been getting all crazy about Jah and all these type of things and stuff, and they don't realize these people kind of started, perfected slavery, came up with rules for it, and then guess, guess who they taught to end up doing the thing that ended up bringing about black people being in slavery for the hundred, hundreds and hundreds of years, way before white people did it, too. And, and it's these people doing it right here at this same time and stuff. I mean, uh, they, they talk about having Egyptian slave wives, and Abraham had one and stuff and everything. But uh, anyhow, back over here, he, he's, uh, 
Everyone who's, uh, let's see, bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name. Well, people aren't called by your name. Um, I, I'm guessing your name here is Yahweh. And nobody in the Bible has Yahweh. They might have a little bit in their, in their name, but most of them don't. So it's going to be pretty hard. People who are called by my name. That's just bad vernacular there, you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little... Oh, wait, hold on a second. Up here at the top, and there, and there, and ding. And then uh, here we got people. I gave people for your ding. Yeah, I gave people in exchange for you with Egypt and everything and all this. Where did you come from? Well, they gave people. They traded slaves for you, apparently. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, whom I created for my glory. Everyone who is called by my name, whom, whom I created for my glory. Oh, you created your name for your glory whom I formed and made. Aha! Uh -huh. So you're telling me that you created this name Yahweh and you formed it and you made it. You made that name. And you created it for your glory. Like you probably have another name like Feud but you've made that name of Yahweh like the Bane of Ea. Ea's Ve. Ea's Bane, yeah. And so he didn't want those people from the north. I mean, apparently they're too smart for this crap. So what does he want? Well, down here at eight, he wants, bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes. What? Who are deaf yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Well, hold on a second. You want people that are blind but have eyes. So you're, oh, you're, you're saying you don't want literally blind people. What you want to do is to have people that are blinded and dumb to this situation. Bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes. These people who cannot see what's going on. Who are deaf yet have ears. Like they can hear this crap, but they just don't get it. Bring all those people out. That's the ones that we're going to take and put under this crap. That's the one we're going to do this to. And then at 9, right up here, he says, I switched to Strong's version, by the way. At 9 here, he says, Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled who among them can declare this and show us former things. So he wants to get knowledge from other people and show us the former things. Let them bring forth their witnesses and that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it's truth. So he's wanting people to try to agree with him and say that it's true, that he is the Lord. Even though he's just showing up now, you know, and uh, there's a few million people on the world that we figured out now. It's got to be a few million people. And, and this whole group right here might make up 3% of the population that, that that's, that's the God of everything. And right here at 11. It says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. And what? No, no, no. Listen, in the Bible, um, Jesus is sitting at your right-hand side, right beside you. And he's the Savior. Oh, no. I, I'm the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Ooh. Um. Ding. He goes on at 12 here to get jealous and tell him why. He goes, I've declared, I saved, I showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Yeah, when when there was no strange God among you. Well, the, that was pretty rare. We're coming to find out that the, quite often, you know, we're doing something else. Or no, that wasn't something else. That was... Well, what are you trying to do? You're trying to gather the blind and deaf and stuff, the people that don't understand, and you're not trying to show them light either, by the way. Anybody that tries to learn stuff or later, you don't teach them. The Dark Ages are called that for a reason. Just when I think it's over, it always brings me back. Just a little bit lower down here, all of a sudden, if you'll look right here, God says there's dragons. Yep, the beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls. The hell's he talking about? Oh, that's a metaphor. The owls are going to be the wise people, and the dragons are going to be the, the dragon, the serpent of old people, the snake. So this is the Babylon people and everything. No, no, no. Well, he says he's, there's, there's dragons. Dragons and owls. He says it right there. Dragons. 
Israel's not faithful. I mean, uh, Israel's unfaithfulness. Jacob here. Hast thou not called upon me, O Jacob? Thou hast been wary of me. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. What is it other than cattle? It's people. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor weary thee in incense. With a, What's the incense? That's the old people being burned, by the way. Um, thou hast brought me no sweet cane uh, with money and all this type of stuff. So he hadn't been doing anything to um, worship God. Um, so, you know, this is God's chosen people. And he's like, where have you been? And they say that again at Sinai, like a... Well, you know, you have who have you been giving all this worship to? It's not been me, and they're like, and this this always seems strange to me because this shows you it's not the same God because they were worshiping somebody, and then he shows up and says, "Hey, you ain't been giving it to me," and then he tells him to that you got to start killing kids to him. Do what? By the way, about six or eight times now you can find in the Bible where it seems like God is begging him to come back and he starts telling him that he promises all this fruitfulness and his family and big generations and he's going to get all this land and yet he don't give them no land for 40 years. They never see this land in the first place and, and stuff. So uh, he, he doesn't give them any of that. There's no fruitfulness. He doesn't make it rain or anything for these people whatsoever. In fact, he really doesn't come through on much any of that uh, sanctuary kind of thing, does he? And so here he goes. Uh, he, he knows he's sinned and stuff and, and, and has gone against where the word. And now God, God's supposed to just leave him alone and never touch him again. But he goes, I, even I, he that blotteth out thy, thy transgressions for my own sake. Yeah, for his sake, because there ain't nobody else with these people at all. He don't have a people and will not remember thy sins. Oh, so you're going to let all this go. Oh, so that's another thing you're offering me. You're like, hey, man, I wanted to let all that crap go, too. Really? Because you said you, you know, oh, this is God, like, you know, letting it go. That's not part of the thing. That doesn't have any anything to do. No, you're just going to let it go because you want him so bad because you ain't got nobody. Really?